Hello, and welcome back to Over My Dead Pod. My name's Holly Spear. This is Kate Carter. And I'm Kylie Colwell. And today I have a very maddening story for Kate and Kylie. And by maddening, I mean frustrating. Great. I'm so excited. Cannot wait. Love these. It's going to frustrate me. I can already tell. Mm -hmm. All right. So we can just hop right into it. In the dark records of criminal history, few narratives invoke as much heartache and intrigue and despair as those stories centered around missing children. This is the exact feeling in Wollongong, New South Wales in 1971. Wollongong, New South Wales is a city located in Australia. It lies on a narrow coastal strip There are narrow coastal plains and a continuous chain of surfing beaches and rainforests. This is where the Grimer family lives. The Grimer family is a young family, and the mother, Carol, is 26, and the father, Vince, is 24. And they have three sons, Ricky, Stephen, and Paul. And the brothers are seven, five, and four. And the youngest one is Cheryl, and she's only three years old. So the Grimer family was originally from England, but they have just moved to Wollongong. So today in Wollongong, it is 1970, and it is a hot January day in New South Wales, but the Grimer family lived right across the street from Fairy Meadow Beach. And the four little Grimer children were desperate to go to the beach. Carol, their mother, was skeptical, but Ricky nagged his mother. They were new to the area, and they had just moved in, and there was a nice huge beach across the street for them to go and play at and take advantage of. So Cheryl eventually gives in, and she takes her three children down to the beach. The family has a normal day. They take photos, build sandcastles, and splash around in the water. The children look back and remember not wanting to go too deep in the water. Um, Ricky, the oldest, remembers being skeptical of the beach. They had just moved from a place that had no beaches to acclimating to this new beach life. There were many families on the beach today, and it was very crowded. It was turning out to be a cute family outing in their new little town. It was not long after that, a small storm rolled in off the coast. And they called this storm in the material that I was looking at, a summer gust or something like that. So I didn't know if you Florida people knew, like, it's like a storm that rolls in, but it's just like big gusts of wind. But it didn't sound like it was like raining or anything, but just like crazy gusts of wind that like blows everything. That sounds like a tropical storm coming. The wind began blowing the beachgoers' umbrellas. Things are rolling down the beach. It's just like pandemonium. Sand's blowing around, and everyone at the beach just starts hurriedly packing up all of their belongings and kind of seeking shelter because they have all of their stuff, you know, all the things you take to the beach with you. So it's suddenly crowded as everyone was hurrying up the beach. Carol gathered her kids and her things as fast as she could. She went ahead and told her kids to go ahead, hurry home, and she would finish up gathering their stuff. She would be right behind them. They live right across from the beach. Shouldn't be an issue. So Carol asked the oldest son, Ricky, to take care of his little sister, Cheryl. They had to stop by the shower blocks in the bathrooms to wash the sand off of their legs. So so this is basically a building that some call shower blocks, some call bathroom, shower rooms, whatever. It's basically a little building in between the beach and um, their house. They're kind of the only ones there at this point. So on the way, the children stop and they grab a drink at the water fountain, which they called the bubbler, which is just so cute. Is that English or like Australian slang? Girl, I don't even know. <laughs> you know, I, I I don't even know what where we're at in geography wise. So I don't know. Um, it's the bubbler, you know. So Cheryl's not tall enough to reach the fountain, so Ricky lifted his little sister up while she got a drink, and then they kept heading towards the shower. Once the children reached the building, Cheryl ran into the girls' shower room. She was halfway in and, like, halfway out of the shower room door and was teasing her older brothers by running in and out, peeping at them, knowing that, you know, they couldn't come into the ladies' room. So she's just being a little kid, like, she's kind of halfway in, halfway out of the doorway, like, back in, back in, you know, like, teasing them. The older brothers are sitting there going back and forth, trying to coax their little sister out. And Ricky, who was the oldest, tasked with being in charge of his little sister, threatened that if she didn't come back out, he was going to go get their mom and she would be in trouble. Ricky said that this did not face Cheryl. She just kept smiling, laughing, popping in and out of the door. 
And the two younger brothers had kind of given up on Cheryl and they were playing in an open area beside the shower room, but they're like within eyesight. So they're playing around. Ricky's like still trying to get Cheryl to come out of the bathroom. All three of the little boys just kind of ran out of options and they ran to go get their mom to go get Cheryl out of the ladies room. Carol, their mother, was right down the beach and still collecting the children's things. Ricky was just seven years old at this time, but he will forever regret this day. So the boys run down to get their mom. She was still bent over gathering things off the sand. Carol follows the three boys up to the shower room to get Cheryl out of the girls' room and they would all head home. But when Carol enters the shower, she doesn't see Cheryl. She asks the boys exactly where they left Cheryl. And they tell them over and over again, Cheryl was just right there. She was just in that stall in the women's room right in front of them. But Cheryl was nowhere to be found. A minute and a half is how long it took for Cheryl to disappear. There were no phones nearby, so Carol made her way hurriedly to a nearby house and asked the residents to call the police. Where would a toddler go in a minute and a half? Who could get away with grabbing a little girl without detection in a minute and a half and get far enough away that they were not seen by any of the families who were constantly in eyesight of Cheryl? Cheryl's disappearance spurred the biggest search that New South Wales had ever seen. Cheryl's dad was actually in the army, so the army joined in the search looking for Cheryl. And just one day after the investigation began, police announced to the public that they have four theories. One, Cheryl's hiding and had fallen asleep. Two, she had wandered into the ocean and had unfortunately been carried away by the currents. Three, she wandered away and fell into another waterway. And number four, she'd been kidnapped. So obviously against number four. Um, the beach one being swept out into the sea is a little, not a very strong one. Yeah. Not that it doesn't happen. But uh, if there were tons of people on the beach that day, and plus the kids were watching her come in and out, like it wasn't, you would have right. seen a child run to the water. Exactly. Like they were running back towards the beach and she was the opposite direction. So they would have crossed paths with her. You know, if she was running towards the ocean, they would have seen her. So, yeah. The day of searching turns up literally nothing. No trace, no crumb of evidence that would tell Cheryl's whereabouts. Um, I think they assumed that if she was sleeping somewhere or wandered off, she would have woken up by now. The day's over. Two and three, carried away by the waterway, just didn't make sense at this point. The day's over and something would have likely washed back or somebody would have seen it. So the police now assume that Cheryl's been kidnapped. Witnesses then come forward and say that they saw a male carrying Cheryl towards the parking lot by the beach where people would park their cars. Um, some witnesses say that they saw a teen in an orange swimsuit in the car park holding a fair-headed child and that he was seen getting into a white sedan and driving away. Some claim a man was seen holding Cheryl up to drink out of the water fountain and then ran off with her wrapped in a towel. These claims now seem unlikely. Police then announced that they are searching for a blue Volkswagen that was sighted near the scene of the crime. There is also reason to believe that a young teen was involved because there was a young male seen running towards bushland from the area Cheryl was kidnapped. On the third day, the family receives a note. The note demanded $10,000 and stated that the child was unharmed and they would drop the money and they would get Cheryl back. Police believe this to be credible, which is weird because usually they don't seem to think this kind of stuff is credible, but some for some reason they do and police stage a drop for the money. They prepare the drop, the money in exchange for Cheryl. Police disguise themselves as council workers for the ransom drop. But the purported kidnapper never showed up. Police fear maybe the kidnapper got spooked because of how many people that they sent, but there was never another note sent and police ultimately were forced to believe that this was a hoax. And by the way, just let me say, like, we run into this a lot in these cases, like fake ransom notes when you find out a kid is missing and people just try to, like, get in on it, which is just bizarre Horrible. or like jokes that lead somewhere fake in the investigation, making a false police report, like funsies. I don't know what, like, what to call that, but. These, this kind of thing, ransoms, happen literally all the time. And it blows my mind, like, wasn't, we just had a case the in Long Island. You know, the ones that's currently just got solved. But didn't they have somebody who, like, tried to put themselves in the situation saying, like, he... I don't remember the exact detail, but it was, like, 
people all the time will come into crime situations and just put themselves in it, even though they have nothing to do with the case. Yeah, like, what? I don't get it. I don't really see much of them either getting charged with anything. I think we should start charging them. Yeah. It's weird. It should be like a false police report, you know? Like, you could get yeah. in trouble for, for filing a false police report, yeah. but... It, putting yourself into the scene of a crime or or butting in for no reason, especially like ran, like a fake ransom note, that should, I mean, it yeah. should be illegal, but I don't yeah. know how you would also catch that person, I guess. Yeah, and then it's like the balance between wanting to take all the leads that they can and, you know, where do they draw the line of this is not credible, you know? So I think it's like, it's hard to not treat it as credible, even when they know it's probably not but it happens all the time. It's freaking ridiculous and it wastes precious and valuable time and is obviously devastating to families. So anyways, whatever. That was just BS. So ransom note, we don't think it's a thing. Um, police say that they have three main suspects and for the life of me, I could not figure out if they named any of them. Like I searched them everywhere and could not figure out if they ever named these three suspects that they said that they had, but they said that they had three main suspects. I mean, the reason for that may be because none of them could positively be identified with the man that all the witnesses had described seeing. There's a $50,000 reward offered by the New South Wales government, and then the case goes cold. Right. Love it. Yeah. Cold for decades. Decades? Decades. There was a lot of people seeing stuff and turning in reports of seeing stuff, and yet none of that hand through. Not yet. <laughs> oh, okay. This will sit untouched for 47 years. Untouched? So no one's working it. No one's touched it. I just tried to do the math in my head. I'm not, I don't know, I can't, but 2000s, obviously. Yes. Wow. So obviously a lot can happen in 47 years. The Grimer family, to say the least, was never the same. Just three young boys now. And they're now men in their 50s. And they would later tell 60 Minutes that this day had changed their family forever, obviously. Their mother and father became cold, and it was a harder life for the three boys after that. Their father was very hard on them, and they could tell that kind of the vibe was like, you lost my baby daughter, you know? Above all else, the father kind of blamed Ricky. And the father started drinking too much, and true feelings of blame would kind of come out. It was obvious to the whole family that the boys were blamed for their sister's disappearance. So fast forward a little bit, not a little bit, a lot of it, to May 2011. A coroner would formally rule that Cheryl was dead and recommended police reopen the investigation. And now remember, we don't have a body or anything, but people are pushing for this case to be reopened. And they're pushing for it to be reopened as a homicide investigation and not a kidnapping. And shortly after the case was reopened, both Mother Carol and Vince would die without knowing what happened to Cheryl. This is when Detective Frank Vitali would be handed Cheryl Grimer's cold case and make a stunning discovery. Police would call the development a breakthrough, but the Grimer family would call it something that was blatantly missed, a vital clue that was found just by looking at the old case files, something that should have been caught and followed up on right away, something that could have changed the Grimer's family life. Detective Frank's discovery would show that the possible killer was known all along and living amongst them. He found a confession that had just been filed away in a box. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so, someone, it's not funny, but. <laughs> okay, wait. Is this confession like a self written one that he sent in, or someone recorded this, put it in the file, and then didn't touch it for? What, 50 years? It was a full police interview. Just filed away. Like, oh yeah, we won't need this. Yeah. Yeah. Someone made a mistake. Someone made a big boo-boo. Yeah. Multiple people made a big boo-boo. That's... Okay. I'm already frustrated. So, Detective Frank discovers that 18 months after the kidnapping in 1971, a local teenager confessed not only to the abduction, but the murder of Cheryl Grimer. This 17-year-old at the time had escaped from a youth detention center and had been caught and now had confessed his story to, I think, guards of the detention center. 
Police at that time, back in the day, made their way to the detention center to interview this boy. Now, the boy is 17 years old, and his name has yet, to this day, to be released. He's not 17 anymore. What? (laughs) But he's 17 at the time. His name has never been released. So we'll just call him John for the sake of this story. So detectives sit down with John and ask him to recount the murder. This is the very first time that the Grimer family is hearing about this confession. With everyone else, this is the first time his family's heard about this. They were never told that a man that lived in the same town as them had confessed to the murder of their sister. The family hears the confession for the first time. John came to the beach early that day. He came around from the back of the shower block and grabbed Cheryl. He carried her four kilometers from Fairy Meadow Beach into what was then just farmland. This is a quote. I tied a handkerchief with a shoelace around her mouth to stop her from screaming, and with the other shoelace, I tied up her hands. She started to scream, and she would not be quiet. He told police that he took Cheryl's swimsuit and towel with him and dumped the towel in the drain outside of a service station and her swimsuit in the incinerator at a camping ground by the beach. They use this word incinerator um, in the camping spot, but what I kind of think it is is those fire pits that you just throw stuff in. They say incinerator, but... He did confess that the ultimate goal was assaulting Cheryl, but when she started to make noise and scream, that's when he tied her mouth and she did not wake up, is what he claims, allegedly. So, um, So he strangled her? Yeah. Okay. He describes the bathing suit in detail, saying that it was royal blue and her towel was white, which is consistent with what she was wearing and what she had that day. He vividly describes where he left the body. It was down Brooker's, and I'm going to butcher this, but it's Belogany. Yeah, down this road. So this is where Cheryl was killed. John takes the detectives in 1971 to where he claims he killed Cheryl. But they arrive, and there's buildings all in the area. So there's been development in this area, and buildings are covering the place that he said that he assaulted and killed Cheryl. But John goes on to try to describe what the area was like at the time. He said there was a tubular steel gate, a cattle guard, a track, and a small creek running near the area. So police do double check this guy's story, which is just miraculous that they even did that. But they go to check this guy's story and they speak to the owner of the property at the time. And the owner actually says, yeah, no, there was no cattle guard here at the time of the murder. And there was never been a tubular gate. So that's just enough for police. They say, yeah, not credible. Not a credible statement, even though he's described literally every detail that only someone there would know because the owner of this property was like, yeah, no, don't remember that gate being there that they're like, okay, yep, file box and that's it. Question for you. This teenager at the time, was he was on the run when he did this? Mm -hmm. From a detention center. I mean, so like for kids that did crime do we know what he was in that detention center for you know i don't know i said well they probably don't have it because we would we don't even have his name you know like it's not okay but we know for a fact he was in a detention center for some reason escaped and did this while he was an escapee yes okay police just concluded that this confession was false and filed it away for 47 years 47 years later, Detective Frank would read this confession and is like, wow, wait a second, like, this guy has a huge level of detail that a false confessor wouldn't have. I mean, we know it's possible for there to be false confessions, but I think at an investigator's standpoint, he knew the details that the public would have known, and he's like, there's no way, you know? It was impossible to give for someone to give this level of detail and not have something to do with the murder. There's no way in the world that a teen from 47 years ago could have made this up. So the family's shocked to say the least. All this time they've been searching for answers, waiting and watching their mother and father die without having known that there was a credible confession to their little sister's murder. So Frank's opinion was there was not one untruth in the confession. Frank returned to the area that he claims to have left Cheryl's body, now being back in the 2000s, 2011, And of course, there's even more development in this area that's gone on in 47 years. But Frank ends up finding the property owner's son, 
The son contradicts his father's claim and says that he is certain that there was a cattle guard at the time in the exact place that he recalled and that there was also a tubular gate and a track leading over the creek into the property. So he says he actually remembers the fence being built. Same fence that police used to just dismiss the confession. And police now backtrack. They now find the campground incinerator where he claims to have burned Cheryl's swimsuit is right where he said it was. And the service station that he ditched her towel was exactly where he said it was. So they're backtracking on all the things they should have done 47 years ago. And they're finding that it is consistent with exactly what he said. Of course, you know, you're not going to find the towel or the swimsuit at this time, but his story's checking out, you know. So here's what seals the deal. John describes watching Cheryl have a drink at the bubbler. The interviewer asks, did the little girl come out with the other children? He replies, yes, she had a drink at the water fountain. Someone lifted her up, I think. This confirms to the family that he was there watching and waiting for his opportunity to strike. So just another like little added detail that like all the brothers remember that happening and only somebody that was there would know, you know? You know what's crazy is I wonder what this guy's thinking, John. He made a full on confession to the police and just nothing happened for 47 years. The fact that they just went off of that one farmer's like, oh, no, that fence was never there. And they were like, oh, okay, that's it. Don't need to look into it, you know? And multiple people said on the beach that day that they thought it was a teenager, like they had seen a teenager, you know? And so they still do not to this day, like in this, I watched the 60 minutes about this and they still don't let this guy be identified, but it's actually hilarious because they're like 60 minutes, like with their camera crew and they're like filming this guy carrying his groceries out of the store. So like, apparently everybody knows who he is. And they just blur his face, but they don't release his name. Like, his name is not in, it's not anywhere. He hasn't been arrested? He's just out? Well. Grocery shopping? We'll get to that, but. Okay. Threw us for a loop right there. Yeah, but today he's just out just getting his groceries. And um, he's 65, and he's just going about his normal life. So, yeah. I think I'd move, but I don't know. You know, whatever. Um, He's clearly invincible. Yeah. So this man basically doesn't give a shit because he has anonymity. So Detective Frank starts trying to get a hold of John. And then one day he gets a call back and John asks, what do you need to speak to me about? Frank says, you tell me. And there was a very long pause. And then he asked, is it something that I did when I was very young, which I regret every day of my life? And then says, is it about a young girl on Ferry Beach? And I'm sure that Detective Frank says yes. Um, John agrees to meet the detectives. And the first question the detectives asked him is, why do you not have legal representation with you? Because this is a formal interview. And he says, because I just want to get this off my chest. So detectives are on their toes thinking, okay, he's about to reconfess to this murder. They present him with his 1971 confession. He admits he made the confession. And he actually signs it and signs every page of it. The detectives then ask him a simple question. Did you do it? And John just flips the script and he says he was never there. So signs all of the confession saying all the stuff he said this. He said this about the bathing suit. He said this about the towel. He said this about the girl. And then just completely changes his mind and says, no, I was never there. Well, he's like, you didn't arrest me back then. Why would I reconfess yeah. to it? Yeah. So police obviously don't believe this and he doesn't have an alibi for the day. I mean, he's had 47, 48 years to come up with one and police just discount as this as him being even more guilty. Detectives tell him that he will be charged with the murder of Cheryl Grimer and will be extradited back to New South Wales. And he didn't seem to put up much of a fight and Detective Frank has no doubt that he has the right man. So, May 2017, it was revealed to the public that the police had arrested the same suspect that had confessed to Cheryl's abduction and murder in 1971, but the confessions, as we know, had been dismissed. Case goes to trial. At trial, John's lawyer argued that the confession was not admissible because he was 17 years old and did not have a parent present when he confessed in 1971, 
Um, at that time, it was not a law that a minor had to have a parent or a lawyer present while being interviewed as police, but... He was in the detention center when he was interviewed, right? Yeah, I think, yeah. It's not like they could even be there, but okay. Yeah. I mean, Doesn't I guess they could have had, like, a guardian or, like, a guard or... with him or a lawyer with him. I don't know. So that's what his lawyers argue is that the confession shouldn't be used as evidence. Um, the defense also argues that he was mentally unwell at the time of the confession. Prosecution claimed that John couldn't have known any of these details without being present at the beach when the abduction occurred, and they should take this into evidence. And strikingly, the judge agreed with the defense attorney. The man's confession would not be included as evidence. The judge also made the point that the police should have told the man that he was a suspect and not a witness to the crime. Um, which I just find ridiculous because, like, you're confessing to murder and you think you're a witness? Well, to, to what? You know? Like, yeah, yeah. I to your own crime. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't get it. Yeah, you're witnessing yourself to- I don't know. Um, so anyway, the prosecution was devastated at this point. Literally all their evidence is built on this confession. The towel, the swimsuit, the series of events where, you know, we know that she's getting a drink at the bubla. Those are all part of the confession. Um, so the Supreme Court of New South Wales found the evidence could not be heard because the teen did not have adult representation present. And the Crown, ex I don't know how all that works, but it says that the Crown accepts that the case cannot succeed without it. And the case was dismissed and he was released from jail. This is crazy. Right? And this was just a few years ago, right? Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. So this is it for Detective Frank, sweet Detective Frank, who has just been grinding away at this case and really cares about this family. He ends up like quitting his job as a detective. He's like, this is enough for me. He believes that, you know, he discovered this cold case detail that cracked the case. He caught the guy, he fought it, and basically gets off on a technicality. And, you know, this is where there's a fine line we hear cases of people that are coerced into confessions or young people or people of low intelligence. And I mean, it happens, we know it happens. Um, police kind of pick out somebody that's malleable or it just kind of like feeds them details, maybe not even meaning to. Um, but then you have cases like this where you see someone kind of slip through the legal cracks and basically get away with murder. So the Supreme Court justice explains that if they were looking at the validity of John's confession, then the story is corroborated. But we know that that's the jury's job to determine the validity of a confession. Oh, it's the judge's job to test the circumstances of the interview and determine what's allowed in court for the jury to rely on. They're not saying that all of this stuff is not true. They're saying that you can't hear it. So currently there are no grounds on which to appeal that would be successful, according to the Attorney General, but the family refuses to accept this. And the three brothers, Ricky, Stephen, and Paul, say that they don't care what toes that they have to step on. They will never stop trying to seek justice for their little sister. And that is where the case is today. And that is the abduction and probably murder of Cheryl Grimer. That is mad. Okay. Have they ever tried to, I don't know, find the body where he said he put it? Not that I know of. I'm saying there's got to be bone something. I know. I mean, I feel like I've heard about cases where they have used like sonar, mm. sonar equipment or whatever to see what's under the ground. I don't know if they can do that if it's just under the ground, but now there's like concrete cement buildings on top i don't know i don't know how all that works no but. i think they can because we saw the one case we did i'm blanking on the name in like in springfield missouri i remember that part they use it on like a parking deck oh yeah yeah um so the brothers that are still alive know the identity of the guy because they like people know who he is his name just isn't released yeah yeah. You're going to tell me that those older brothers haven't tried to kill the guy yet? Right? Like, I am shocked this guy is alive. Same. No, I know. That's exactly what I thought about. him. like, there's no way. There's, there's no, way. no way. I'd go to hireahitman.com. Yeah. <laughs> then call back. They'll call me so, back. 
Another thing I don't know if I'll edit out or not. I mean, I probably won't, but I don't I haven't done as much research on it, but I do know that one of the brothers, not Ricky, I know it's not the oldest one. I think it might be the youngest one was recently charged with um, some sort of sexual crime against a child, which just makes me so mad. Oh, that's not no bueno. Yeah, that's I mean, the first thing I thought was like, well, where was he? Where was he? You know, was he there the whole time, right by his mom? Like, do we have eyes on him the entire time? But I mean, that's um, not good. No, it's not. But they've apparently all the sources that I did look at when I was reading about that have ruled him out completely and said that you know that he was it couldn't have been him. But no one's charged with this crime, so. This is mind blowing. Um, hated the story. Thanks, Holly. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be looking into that down a black hole tonight. Mm-hmm. Um, the fact that his name hasn't been released. I get he was a juvenile when this happened, but nowadays a juvenile commits a crime. We still know their name. Yeah. There is no blacklisting juveniles anymore, you know, stuff like that. But the fact that it's like 50 years later and they still haven't released the name for legal reasons or whatever is some bullshit. I'm going to go ahead and just say that. Um, Unless it's just a different law, which I'm going to definitely like look up and see. I don't know. I don't know. And wouldn't you just think like if, if people know who this man is because he lives his normal life, no one on a blog somewhere wrote his name, you know, like it's just the fact you couldn't find, but the fact you couldn't find it right off the bat is mind blowing. No, it, it is mind blowing, and um, I mean, like, I went to multiple sources, like, researching this case, and I eventually was like, well, I guess it doesn't matter, you know, like, yeah, if if you Google his name, I don't know what's going to come up other than like blog stuff, you know. So I was like, okay, but I'm sure oh, wow. Reddit, it's somewhere on Reddit, you know. I, I yeah, I was going to say, Kylie, I'll let you do that. I don't do Reddit because I end up going in insane. We'll update you guys all next week once Kylie figures out this guy's name, where he lives, and his mother's, you know, maiden name, Social Security. Wow, what a story. How did you find that one? Kylie, is that the story you knew as well? Uh, Actually, no. I know another Australian, I think it was like three kids, three or four kids, siblings that went missing. Oh, Oh, shit. We have a serial kidnapper. I'm trying to think of what the name of it is. How'd you find that story, Holly? Because that's like not our location nor our timeline, you know? 60 minutes, Australia. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, they got some good Australian cases or something. I bet they do. There's some. Australia is the Florida, you know. Oh, there it is. The Beaumont. The Beaumont children. Beaumont. That sounds really familiar. He has three kids missing for 57 years, seven months, and 30 days from Glenelg Beach south australia hey, that's around the same time that's really yeah, weird. that is should we should we be one of those podcasts that like solves a murder i think we should Only yeah we can the building we'll fly, we'll fly ourselves out there is I, this a tax write-off yeah is this yeah. a business expense an australian vacation dude let's just we'll strap millie on once she's born and just hop out of here she'll be a little crime crime solver all right well you guys want to go ahead and jump right into overtime so we're going to jump into our overtime story. What do you got, Halls? Girl, I have just been straight chilling. Um, Holly came up with nothing. <laughs> she was like, I'm just chilling. I'm good. Chilling, girl. Um, so I think I told you all that uh, Luke and I got our scuba diving certification. Did I tell oh, you yeah. that? Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. I have a major update for in your life, Holly. You're a sworn in attorney. Yeah, I didn't forget about that. Um, (laughs) Like, that's what's happened. You were like, where are you going to go with this, Kate? That happened. We, ladies and gentlemen, our own Holly Spear is now a sworn in attorney for the state of Arkansas. Officially licensed. (laughs) Kylie is too, but we probably said, well, okay. So two of the three of us. I think we did, but. Two of the three of us are licensed attorney and the other one is pregnant. So there you go. Life updates. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm She's got all kinds of updates that we just like shouldn't ever say. No, we talk about my updates after we hit stop recording. 
Yeah, and the updates that Kate gives us is like no one should ever hear. She's freaking welcome to pregnancies. Yeah, she's well, traumatizing the group. I mean, truly. Yeah, you know, well, you're con- educating us, and then we're just cringing the entire time. Yeah, so get ready to be pregnant someday. That's all I gotta say. Um, if but Kate back- has anything to do with it, no one will ever be pregnant ever again in the whole world. Yeah, love you, the baby girl that's in my tummy. Love you so much. Mommy is going to be the best mommy ever. But uh, pregnancy sucks. Yeah. Like, yeah. kudos to all the women that are like, I'm glowing. I want to be pregnant all the time. Like, women who have 10 kids, absolutely not. Deranged. Not, a, not my thing. Um, but back to Holly, licensed attorney. What would tell us the process? What was that like? You went to the courthouse, obviously. Well, yeah. she went to law school. So <laughs> first she applied to law school. Yeah. I had a dream. No, um, yeah, I did the little like oh swear in thing, and now I have a little ceremony where I get a little certificate, and then they're like, Okay, now give us all the money you owe us, and then I do that, and that's it. Wow. But I'm Very super excited. I'm glad it's over with. As Kylie knows, the bar is absolutely a hazing ritual, I'm convinced. And it's terrible and stupid and it should be abolished. And that's how I feel. But yeah, and but and, you know, it's so much more fun. I got my scuba diving certificate. I mean, I'm mm. scuba now. So where are you scooping? Where do you you going in lakes and stuff? Um, y'all, I got certified in a lake. It was hilarious. Got certified at the bottom of a lake. Like, take your mask off, do all the little tests and stuff, and I couldn't see a damn thing. I mean, it was murky. And these guys, they were giving their scuba lessons, but I really think they were out there so that they could scour the bottom of the lake for like people's like Ray Bans, dead bodies. Yeah, that's what I think of. Oh, I know that freaks me out. It's a weird gig, but we we did it in Cosmel when we went on vacation, and it was that's really cool. awesome. Yeah, and Luke's working on getting his pilot's license now, which I thought Kate would appreciate because her dad is he's a he flight is, attendant right? now. He's a flight okay. attendant. He's a flight but attendant. He was a but pilot. Yeah, yeah, he had his yeah. pilot's license, and um, really cool, really cool. That's a hefty process. So kudos to him for going, you know, starting that. And yeah, yeah, for sure. Peace is out, Holly. And with that, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Over My Dead Pod. If you want even more information, including photos and sources of the case, you can check out our blog, OverMyDeadPod.com. And be sure to leave us a review wherever you're listening to this and check us out on social media. We will see you next week with another thrilling case. Bye. Bye. Bye.